What's up guys, Spencer here. Today I'm going to be going over multiple linear regression in R. So everything that's going to be detailed in this video is pretty much all you really need. So let's get right to it. So today I'm going to be using the real estate data set from Kaggle. The primary purpose is to predict the house price per unit area over here, given all of these independent variables here. A quick overview on this is that there's approximately 400 observations and there's roughly eight. There are eight independent variables that I'll be using. The thing you really want to do is to clear your workspace. You would just run this particular function that I pre-written already up here. And then you want to reset your working directory to wherever your data set lies. So since I already have my data that's loaded, over here, I'll just load it in. Let's take a real quick look at what the data looks like inside of R. And we have this. So it looks pretty good. It looks very similar to what, in fact, uh, the exact same as what we have on Excel. There's one slight change I would want to make, and it is the transaction date. I want to order that inside of the data set. So let's do that real quick. All I have to do is just call the data. And I want to order it on the specific column transaction date. So let's order that particular uh, value. So that would just be data transaction dates. Oh, I forgot my comma. I bet we have that here. Voila. So it is now ordered and we are good to go on the next step. So let's do that. So the next step is just going to be the exploratory data analysis piece. And you would just use your typical um, functions that I mentioned on my previous video, but it will be like your summary uh, summary function. You just apply that inside and you get something like this. So what I typically look here is to see if there's any NAN values or null values, and it looks like there are not. If there were, then I would try my best to either omit it or I would uh, do some interpolation uh, where I just apply some function to it to replace the null value with some value that's readable for the machine. Uh, I would also use the string value. Uh, and what we have here is like, we notice that all eight of our variables are integers slash numerical values. So that's the type of data set that we are working with over here. Uh, there's also a real quick tidbit. Uh, I know that the number uh, the number feature here is irrelevant. It's just an index. So let's remove that. So remove the number variable. So we would do that by just calling data on data. Get all the rows. And then we just want two to eight column. And let's take a look at that data. And bam, it is removed. So we are good to go. And also just notice that this index is out of sync because we ordered it on the transaction date. So there's nothing to worry right there. So once we move that, let's look at the correlation matrix of our data so that we can get understanding on the relationships between our different variables and our independent variables and dependent variables. So there's a really neat function on that, which is the core value. We just pass in our data set. Um, this is a little bit unreadable, so let's just call this on the view function, on the correlation, on data. So that's a little bit more readable. Um, so there's a few values that really stand out. Uh, we could have negative correlation values, which is fine. But the closer it is to 1, then the more... Uh, more correlated the two variables are. So this is just an n by n matrix. Notice that the diagonal is are ones because uh, a variable that's related to itself is always going to be one. So uh, we notice that there's a few variables like you know negative 0.8. Uh, there's values like negative 0.67. So these are all relatively like I guess strong correlations, either positive or negative. Some of the correlations that are probably meaningless are like values that are really close to zero, meaning that they don't relate to each other at all, roughly. Once we've completed our exploratory analysis piece, let's now check for linearity uh, and just uh, justify our assumptions for our given particular model. 
So let's do this. Uh, let's attach our data so that I don't have to write the annoying dollar sign all over the place. And just for sanity, we can just detach it when we are finished with this particular data. So I'll just put that all the way down there and we can go back up. So once I attach the data sets, let us look at the general relationship on the transaction dates, as well as the Y variable that we are predicting, which is going to be the house per area per unit. And we can get a general understanding on what we are working with over here. Okay, and so notice that this is probably more useful if this was in a box plot since the Y axis is a transactions or the number of transactions and the X axis is just the date. And also, let's clean up the dates a little bit so we can do some further data cleaning, but that's no problem at all. So let's actually, um, so I guess I would have to write dollar signs, but let us yeah, round off the data set on the transaction dates. And I'll just do something like this. We can round it off. And let's plot the box plot so we can get a better understanding on what that is. So a really nice function is just a box plot and we can get the Y in terms of X. Uh, so that will look something like house per units per area tilde transaction date. And the data sets is coming from data. And let's call this the main. This is the relationship of house House price per unit, house price per unit versus transaction date. Bam, that looks a lot cleaner right here. This is a pretty nice overall visual on what we are looking at in terms of the relationship of the transaction dates and the house, uh, the house per price per unit area. Now let's do a similar relationship of just an XY plot on our all of our other plots. And luckily I pre-wrote that. So what this is doing here is that it's just setting the number of panes or panels uh, for two rows by three columns. So I'll just have like a two by three graph in terms of, I can have six graphs inside of that particular matrix. And let us look at that. I think I just need to run this piece first. Bam. And we can do it like a nice zoom over here. So as we can tell, there's um, somewhat of a relationship, I guess, uh, in terms of like identifying what we could potentially use. There seems to be like a somewhat of a U shape going on here, an exponential shape here, somewhat of a linear shape. Um, but this is just like an overview on what type of data we are dealing with here. So after, after we... Um, just plot out all of our X and Y variables. We can reset the dimensions of our par value so that once we plot stuff, it would just be in its regular format. So we don't have to worry about that. So the next thing that we would want to do is to check the QQ plots, uh, which, is, which is essentially just checking whether or not our data is closely resemble, uh, if, whether or not it closely resembles, uh, whether, or not, whether or not the data follows like a normal distribution. So let's can do that here, the QQ norm. And these are all the variables that we are working with. So let's do that real quick and do another par over here. And let's plot that. And we can do a nice zoom. So as we can tell here, there's somewhat, this looks pretty good, that looks all right. And this is where like the, just eyeballing it comes into play. Uh, there are some packages we can use and uh, in the future we'll be using some of those to determine whether or not these data actually follow a normal distribution. Um, so let us double check. Uh, and so <laughs> previously the QQ plots were somewhat well, not really linear. So that's kind of worrisome on what type of data we are working with. But let us do the Shapiro-Wilkes Shapiro -Wilkes test. The uh, null hypothesis here is that the data is, uh, what data are normally distributed. Uh, the p-value threshold is 0 0.05. And let us do that over here, over here, there we go. And let us get the values here. So the p-value here is less than 0 0.05, which says that the data are not normally distributed, which is um, 
worrisome but for the sake of this video we will continue on but this is a is essentially like a red flag as to whether or not your data are even up to the challenge on creating a great linear model here the next piece is just going to be the model creation we're going to go in assuming that our data is pretty good uh, but we're going to get a like i guess maybe a somewhat bad model uh, but let's find out so we can do our typical lm function very powerful by the way uh, the house price per units and let's do the tilde all of our independent variables here and the data is equal to the data but before we even jump into whether or not our model is good or not there's a few values that we need to check uh, the first is to determine whether or not our independent variables have multicollinearity. Multicollinearity. And there's a really nice function, the VIF function. It stands for variance inflation factors. Uh, and essentially, if our VIF value, if VIF value is greater than 5, then there is a high probability that your particular variable in question has collinearity. Uh, has a collinear co relationship with another variable. If it's greater than 10, then most definitely your variable needs to essentially just be removed. So let's take a look at that. We just pass in our model in here, this model, also right here, definitely remove. Let's pass in the vif, cannot find function. Uh, I think the car library that we need to load in. Um, but let's run the other vif, and we notice that none of our values are greater than 5, which is a good sign. So after we double check on whether or not our variables have collinearity with another variable, uh, let us go and check whether or not there is autocorrelation. Autocorrelation. This is essentially determining whether or not one value is dependent on another, val uh, another value. Uh, this is largely related to uh, time series data on a minute by minute or a day on day type of a, of a value. Uh, but in this case, since we have like a year to year, we can sort of apply the ACF, but this is uh, not really the data set to apply to, but this is just for your learning over here. So we'll just do the ACF on let's do the house price per unit area on what we're trying to predict and there's a plot over here but let us reset the dimensions over here so that we can have a better visual what that looks like here it is so uh i'm just touching real lightly on this subject but essentially since the acf dies out very quickly it's within these bands within two or three um dimensions removed or i mean observations removed uh, we notice that it's within the bands so we know that the tails are dying out which means that there is not a there's not a high relationship between dependency so that's a very very good sign hey guys let's cut it there the next video will be on actually how to create the model instead of looking at the independent components that make up the model see you in the next one Please let me know if you